My subject this morning is entitled, Behold, Thy King Cometh. I know it's more of um, 1900 Queen Elizabeth English. <laughs> Amen. Behold, thy king cometh. And I like how the King James rendered it. Behold, thy king cometh. In 2013, the CEO of Facebook, Mark Zuckerberg, who is also owns Instagram and also WhatsApp, Mark Zuckerberg made an unusual purchase in 2013. What he did was that he paid for almost $30 million, U.S. dollars, to purchase four homes that were close to Palo Alto house that he had. So this is his house, and he purchased these four homes that are kind of surrounding his house. It cost him 30 million US dollars to buy that home. And the reason why he went forward to p make this purchase is because he heard the news that the local real estate developer there announces a plan to buy this house and to build it and make it like a, a tourist attraction. So they are going to buy this house and they are going to develop it so that the house will be developed in such a way that you can... If you stay in one of these four homes, you can look through the homes and the bedroom of Mark Zuckerberg. So he got the news, and he offered these homeowners money they cannot reject. He bought his neighbors out so that the real estate developer will not have the privilege to intend to do what they were planning to do. You see, with Mark Zuckerberg, money is not a problem. When he made this purchase at that time, he was 30 years old and he, his overall net wealth was $30 billion. You know, sometimes there is kind of difference. You, you may not con conceptualize the difference between one million and one billion. He says one billion, just one zero. But this give a presentation of the difference between $10,000, $1 million, and $1 billion. So Mark is rich that he does not need help to solve problems that money can help. Are you guys with me? He doesn't need help to solve problems that money can solve, like buying off your neighbor as he did by spending that $30 million. But the paradox of this idea is that God doesn't operate that way. So God, who is almighty, the creator of heaven and earth, the sustainer of heaven and earth, he chooses to work with the agencies of men to accomplish his purpose. Are you guys with me? He, like Zuckerberg, has all the resources available to him. By the way, he has 10,000 times 10,000 and 1,000 times 1,000 angelic hosts. And yet, God chooses to use human agencies in accomplish his purpose. So turn your Bibles with me to the book of Zechariah chapter 9. The Bible says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem, behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation, lonely and riding on a donkey, a colt, a foil of a donkey. Zachariah prophesies that there is a day coming that Israel as a nation will receive her king. And this king who is coming, he is having salvation and he is a just king. Now, Zachariah prophecy did not leave any doubt in our mind who he is talking about. Are you guys with me? Zion is called upon to rejoice. Why? Because her promised salvation will be realized through the coming of a king. Now, who is this king? And as I said, 
we have in no doubt based on the context, based on the words of Zachariah that this king, we know that he is just. And we know that not only that he is just, but he has salvation. We read in the book of First Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30, the Bible says, But of him you are in but of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Jesus is the king who is coming, who is just and have salvation. There is no doubt in our mind that who this king is because we are also told in the book of Acts chapter 4 verse 12 that nor is there salvation in any other. There is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. There is no other name under heaven, and that includes the Seventh-day Adventist church name. Are you guys with me? The name does not save. There is only one name according to the test here that men can be saved, and that name is the name of Jesus Christ. So when the daughter of Zion is called upon to rejoice because the king that is coming, having salvation, and he is just, they were anticipating the coming of the Messiah. The coming of Christ, who will bring salvation to them. So Israel was waiting for this to come. And friends, they waited for almost 500 years from the time that Zachariah made that promise until the time Jesus was born and Jesus came as the Messiah. 500 years, they were waiting day by day for this first coming of Christ. Now, and there was a shift because when Jesus came to the scene, he started his ministry at age 30, refused to let the people make him a king. There were so many instances where they were trying and at some point even forcing him to be a king. We read in the book of John chapter 6 verse 15, the Bible says, Therefore, when Jesus perceived that they were about to come and take him by force to make him a king, why? Because they've eaten the bread he blessed on and they want to make him a king. He departed to the mountains by himself alone. So, Jesus came, Israel looking or waiting for the, this coming king, and yet when he came, he refused the people to make him a king because Jesus was on God's schedule. Somebody say amen. And he was not people-driven ministry. He was God-ordained, God-directed ministry. And his time to be a king, his time to go to Jerusalem and enter that city as a king has not come yet. And since then, he waited on God for the rightful time to come. So the rightful time came that Jesus, the last week of his ministry, the Passion Week, he decided that this is the time for me to fulfill Isaiah, Zacharias' prophecy, to ride into Jerusalem as the king who is just and having salvation. So we read in the book of Matthew chapter 1, verse 1 to 3. It started by saying that now when they drew near to Jerusalem and they came to Bethphage or Bethphage, depending upon how you read the name, at the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent his two disciples. You see, Jesus has been in Bethany that weekend before the week of Passion Week. And he is heading towards Jerusalem. And after Jerusalem temple there will be an event with the scribe and the pharisees here he will go into gethsemane then obviously he will go to the cross now when he reached here Bethage or Bethage, depending upon which pronunciation you want what he did was he told his disciple to do something the distance from bethany to jerusalem is about two miles 
So obviously, if you do a little bit exp- extrapolation, it will be about a mile from Bethphage or Bethphage to Jerusalem. So he sent his disciples when they reached that point in verse 2 saying to them, go into the village opposite you and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Lose them and bring them to me. And if anyone says unto you, you shall say, the Lord has need of them. And immediately he will send them. So what Jesus is saying, I am about to fulfill 500 year old prophecy. Are you guys with me? And what I want you to do here, I'm about to do something magnificent. I am about to enter Jerusalem as a king. And what I want you to do, you two disciples, go into Bethphage and go and borrow me a donkey and a colt. And in the process of you trying to untie that donkey, if any man asks you, why are you taking the donkey and the colt too? What you should say is that tell the person that the Lord is in need of that donkey and the colt. Are you guys with me? I want you to use your imagination here. A donkey and a cot. How does God want a donkey and a cot? You see, if you look at when U.S. president passed here, we will know. And the reason why we will know is because you will see, you will hear that somebody who is important is passing by. This kind of show a pictorial view of the U.S. a presidential motorcade. And sometimes it's, it can even be more than this. When the president of the United States show up, you will see that, the, the, that that man is important. And he is coming as the president of one of the greatest nations on earth. And we are talking about God, who is creator of heaven and earth about to enter Jerusalem as a king, he requested for a donkey and a colt. We are talking about God who chose to redeem Elijah and take him to heaven on the chariot of fire. And yet, he is about to enter Jerusalem as a king. He decided to ask for a donkey and a little donkey to fulfill something magnificent, to fulfill 500-year-old prophecy. Obviously, Zachariah has prophesied that indeed God will do that. Friends, let's see what happened. After the donkey came, the Bible says, and all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of by the prophet Zechariah, obviously saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, lonely and sitting on a donkey, a cart, a foil of a donkey. So that the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them. They brought the donkey and the cart, laid their clothes on them, and set, him on, and set it on them. And a very great multitude spread their clothes on the road. Others cut down branches from the tree and spread them on the road. Then the multitude who went before and those who followed cried out saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna to the highest. And the last verse says, And when he had had come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved saying, Who is this who is this the whole city was stirred because of christ jesus entered jerusalem on a borrowed donkey and a cult he fulfilled 500 year old prophecy based on the generosity of a donkey owner it was simple act of giving 
of that donkey that God used that donkey in fulfilling that prophecy. And we are told that because of what Jesus did, the whole city was moved as a result of that. You see, God is the creator of everything. You know that, right? But Elohim says that at his birth, talking about Jesus, at his, at his birth, the Savior was dependent upon the hospitalities of strangers. The manger in which he laid was a borrowed resting place. She continued to say that now, although the cattle of the thousand hills are his, he is dependent on a stranger's kindness for an animal on which to enter Jerusalem as it can. Do you understand what she's saying? Although the cattle of the thousands hill is his, he, just look at the oxymon, oxymoronic idea of a dependent savior. Are you guys with me? Is that the Savior is depending upon the generosity of a stranger in order to fulfill his promise to enter Jerusalem as a coming king. He could have created a donkey. How hard is it for God to create a donkey? Because he spoke and it was done. He commanded and he stood fast. Are you guys with me? He could have created a donkey right then. That would have been awesome and great. Hey, donkey, come and donkey, how many? Maybe five. Or maybe thousands. Yet he says, no. Go and borrow it. Go and ask for it. Let's depend on the generosity of a donkey owner. To fulfill the prophecy of coming as the king. For every beast of the forest is mine. And the cattle of thousands hills, somewhere in Colossians chapter 1, verse 16 and 17, he says, that By him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible or invisible, whether there will be throne or dominion or principalities. All things are made by him and for him, and he's before all things, and by him all things consist. We are talking about a God who owns everything. And yet for him to fulfill this prophecy and come into Israel with salvation and as a righteous judge, he needed the generosity of a donkey owner to be able to fulfill that. There's one here that I wanted you to get. I'm trying to push to the latter end of my message here. To the death of Christ, we owe even this earthly life. <laughs> the bread we eat is the purchase of his broken body. The water we drink is bought by his spilled blood. She says, never one saint or sinner eats his daily food but he is nourished by the body and the blood of Christ. Now look at here. The cross of Calvary is stamped on every loaf. Whether saints or sinners, we live and move and have our being because of him. And for him to accomplish his purpose, God turned to man to depend on the generosity of man in order to enter to Jerusalem as the coming king. And this is where I am trying to really understand the plan and the message of God. Because how is it that God came to the people he has made to ask of the things he himself has created so that he can fulfill his promise. He can fulfill his purpose. I can think of four lessons about this whole contest of Jesus coming to Jerusalem as the promised Messiah with salvation and basing his coming on the generosity of others. Lesson number one is Jesus doesn't always meet our expectations. You know, we have dreams, we have plans, but Jesus sometimes 
doesn't meet our expectation. The Jews were expecting a king like David, who would be a military leader, come with horses and chariots and take them out from the bondage of the Romans. But he came in peace. He came with salvation. Sometimes God doesn't meet our expectations. And, and, and sometimes in our Christian life, we encounter a situation which God doesn't meet our expectations. Perhaps he doesn't bring the marriage partner in our life as we wish for. And maybe you may find that your marriage hasn't lived to the expectation that you thought God will help you to achieve. Or maybe you got passed by for the job or for that promotion. And God did not meet your expectation. And sometimes... It may be illness. It may be tragedy that may strike our home. We never expected that. We never dreamed that this could happen to us. And we think that God hasn't really met our expectations. And the danger is that when we get into that situation, we sometimes decide to take things in our own hands and do things in our own way and move away from the way of God. But I believe that at that time is when we needed to trust God the most because he knows what he's doing. Because he knows what he's doing. So that is lesson number one. The Jews were expecting somebody to come like David with horses and chariots and range war against the Romans. But God did not meet that expectation. And as a result, they rejected him as their coming savior. Although he came in peace, although he came having salvation. Lesson number two is that God blesses our generosity. Amen? God blesses our kindness. When an ordinary person gives in an extraordinary way to the purpose of God, God blesses it. All the donkey owner did was to give a donkey and a little donkey. He has absolutely no idea that based on that kindness, based on that generosity, God is going to do something magnificent and fulfilled 500-year-old prophecy. God blesses our generosity. Jesus rode into Jerusalem as a king, having salvation because of the generosity of a donkey owner. The same way as Liniana gave the children's story. All the small boy did was the loaf and the fishes. And what did God do? He blessed that generosity and fed 5,000 people. Are you guys with me? God blesses one single act of generosity. Joseph of Arimathea, all he did was to donate his tomb. Little did he know that that tomb will be the evidence of God resurrecting in that Sunday morning. Are you guys with me? God blesses our generosity. All Mary did was to donate her womb, to give herself, to give her body for the cause of God. And as a result, the Savior of this world grew up in the womb of Mary. God blesses one single act of our generosity. Lesson number three, four of them, one more to go. Lesson number three. Don't underestimate the impact of your generosity. Don't underestimate the impact of your generosity. Our little act of kindness matters to God. The widow's might, that little, that small widow's might, the quadrant is the smallest Roman's coin. It's six minutes of average daily wage 
That is all she did. And the impact that Jesus' story was based on that. So friends, every single act of kindness is noticed in heaven. Every single one of them. Because we should not, we should not underestimate the impact of our generosity. So it can just be a single act of donating food. It can just be investing time to study the Bible with somebody. It can just be spending time to be involved in the church children ministry. Are you guys with me? Because we need help in our children ministry. Somebody say amen. Amen. That single kindness that I would I would I make myself available and spend time with the children of the church and invest in them. You will be surprised the impact of that single act in that way. So friends, you know that is why the whole concept of people matter project is very important because we know that little act of kindness has a huge impact in the sight of God. The word make flesh is the gospel, and deed without word is dumb, and words without deed is empty. And that is why we should both speak and we should both act or live on what we talk about. We cannot talk about as a loving church while we are not giving services and community services to people that are close to us. You know, that will be words without deeds and it's completely empty. And obviously, our deeds should also follow with words. That will be the smartest things we can do. And I personally believe, friends, that in heaven, you know, you are working in the street of heaven with gold and you are just walking and somebody, hey, Edward, said, do I know you? No, you don't. You know me? <laughs> no, you don't. But you know what? The work you guys did or the Sabbath school offering you guys gave came into this part of the world and there was this evangelistic series and as a result of that donation, I got to know about the love in Jesus and gave my life to him and that is why I'm here where you are. So thank you. Thank you for that. I personally believe it's going to happen. And last but not the least, our generosity write us into the gospel story. All the donkey owner did was to donate his donkey, but you cannot talk about the triumphant entry story without mentioning the donation of the donkey. And this concept is even very great when you look at the story of Mary anointing the feet of Jesus at Bethany. And he spent the most expensive spark near, like almost a year wage, and anointed the feet of Christ before he went to the cross. And as a result of this generosity, as a result of this donation, as a result of this kindness, Jesus himself said, Assuredly I said to you, Wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be told as a memorial of her. Do you understand what Jesus is saying? Jesus says, you cannot preach about the gospel, my gospel that I'm giving you without talking about Mary. Because of what she did, she her story is written into the gospel story. So Jesus says, wherever this gospel is preached, you should talk about her. Because of an act of kindness, an act of generosity. Just that. Again, Joseph of Arimathea, all he did was to donate his tomb for Christ. Why am I going through all of this? Why am I trying to remind us that God would have chosen to work with human agency in finishing his work or accomplish his purpose? The reason why I'm making this point is that Jesus is 
coming again. And the fact that he is coming again, the act of his first coming, those lessons we drew from the act of his first coming is equally important for his second. He returning the second time, God is still in the business of working with human agency to accomplish his purpose, to send his words, to deliver the act of kindness to people, to prepare the world for his soon return. Jesus is coming again. Friends, and sometimes we need to be reminded of the signs around us is clear that he is coming again. The way our world is right now, personally believe that our world is bending so that it can break. We want the world to be a better place. Great idea. But there's a better place waiting for us. And God is dependent upon his people to really show who he is. To really prepare the world before he soon returns. So the signs, and sometimes we may be caught up not even looking at it from that light. But the signs is clear. Jesus is coming again. Yes, we can go through the pandemic. We can go through all those things, but all this evidence of war, and I don't know how many of you is following the news, but Afghanistan is not doing really well. And by the way, there's another call, there's another, in Guinea, there's another disease. I've forgotten the name of that. There's so many diseases, you don't even lose track of their names. And these are all the signs that God said it will come to pass. The point I'm establishing here, friends, is that something is happening in our world. Our world is bending so that it can break because we have to end this. Our job is not to make it better because it can't be better. We can patch it here and there. It can't be better. It has to end because there's a better place waiting for us. But until then, the Lord needs you. The Lord needs you to accomplish his purpose, to accomplish what he needs to do before he soon return. You see, the beautiful part, and I'm done, the beautiful part of this story is this. The last week of Jesus started in Bethany. He went back, Bethage, that's where the donkey issue happened. He went to the temple, discussion, he, come back, he came back to Bethany, I guess, back again, and he went to Gethsemane, and he decided. Look at the beautiful thing. At Bethany, Mary decided to be generous to our Savior, to give her the most precious gift any human can give to the Savior. At Bethage, or Bethage, the donkey owner decided that I will let my donkey and the court to go so that our Savior can ride into Jerusalem as the coming king. And because of that, Jesus decided to make the ultimate sacrifice. At Gethsemane, he decided to die for the sins of human. You can see that there's all act of giving and generosity, and that is the essence of the Christian experience. It is never consumption. It is giving yourself as a living sacrifice. Giving yourself for the cause of God. So friends, I want to encourage us that as we go through this, this stage and this, this scene of our life, that we should remember that he is coming again. And we should remember that God is in need of you and me. The Lord has need of you. The question is, will you respond to that call? And will you be willing to ask simple act of generosity? And I'm not asking you, and even God does not ask us of things that he has himself has not done. And that is why 
Every person in this church, in this denomination, should be part of this. Should be making himself available for God to use him for his soon return. There's a better home waiting for us. Until then, we will speak, share, and we will show that act of kindness and prepare the word for his soon return. You are part, I am part, everybody is part. Let us work together and we will see the face of our Savior. Until then, we can only imagine. Amen.